Okay, we're about to enter our Bible study this evening, studying the doctrine of Paul. But before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's time to use the rebound technique if needed. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're thankful that you have given us Paul as our apostle. But not only that, that his life is recorded and the fact that we can learn from it and sometimes what to do and sometimes what not to do. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's no doubt that Paul was a great man as we study through the life of Paul. We're going to learn some great things, but one of the uh, areas that a lot of people don't think about is how in the Bible, a lot of bad things are recorded. Uh, did you ever think about the fact that uh, the life of Saul is recorded and he started out on the right foot and he was God's chosen king for Israel, but uh the sin of jealousy kick-started a 40-year road of reversionism, winded up with Saul in total uh, neurosis and uh, psychosis. And he was a basket case by the end. And it, it kicked off with one sin. Jealousy. And so we learn from Saul that jealousy is a terrible sin. And that it can bring you down a terrible road. And so just from that one example, we can, we can sidestep a whole world of misery. Uh, we learn from David. David was a super grace believer. But... Uh, he neglected his responsibilities under the law of divine establishment for just a moment. He rested and he stopped gapping it. And what happened? He succumbed to his own area of weakness. And uh, the Bathsheba incident uh, turned into the murder of one of his friends. And not only the discipline to David, but his whole country suffered um, because of his mistake. So there's, there's a lot of incidences in the Bible that are recorded that are bad things where people did wrong. But guess what? They're there for a reason. Do you know why? So that you and I can learn from others' mistakes. Isn't that much better than learning from your own? I love learning from others' mistakes. I built a whole business by taking note of every mistake that you could make while building a race car engine. A whole business. I've stayed in business 15 years for myself. Just making notes of others' mistakes. So it's a great thing to do. And we're going to do it with the life of Paul. We're going to take a look at what we can learn from his life. And learning from others' mistakes. And we've got 20 points of summary really that we're going to hit here at the end, and we're going to learn from Paul, and we're going to make some conclusions, and some doctrinal points, along the way. Now, I want to kick this off from Acts 21, and I'm going to start in verse 7, and we'll read down a few verses here.
Paul is sailing. And it says, And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, greeted by the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. That's see, it's pre-canon era it was legitimate gift back then. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said. Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, he's being hard-headed. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And see, he is, he's off the charts in arrogance here because he knows he's not supposed to go to Jerusalem. He's the apostle to guess what? The Gentiles, not the Jews. Though when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. Do you know what that means? He's got his own volition. You want to be stupid? Do it on your own. We're not going with you. You take off and go. And so we see here that Paul was being hard-headed and hame-headed about, and he was being sentimental about going to Israel to see his Jewish friends. So point number one of learning from mistakes of others. You must never let Christian experience get you out of fellowship. Behind Christian experience must be true doctrine. And man, I learned this with my youth group. If you're going to do youth, you've got to do activities. Everybody knows that. And the best activities are the ones that you can control the doctrine in, okay? But they get tired of listening to you. So every once in a while, you might have to take them to a Christian outing. And we tried to do this. And we, we took our youth group to Christian concerts. And some of them were decent, and some of them were not. We, we took them to the, Christ, the strongman competition where they bent bars and lifted heavy stuff and they talked about the power of Jesus and things like this. And uh, they get to preaching and they, get, they carry the kids away in religious experience. Well, well, well. The doctrine has to be more real than anything you see and hear and touch and taste and feel around you. Yes, it must be. And... Uh, so, Paul teaches us that uh, he, he was feeling a little nostalgic. He was feeling a little sentimental. He got carried away by his emotions by thinking about his Jewish brethren. And uh, see, God had already told him, Paul, I am going to send you to the Gentiles. And Go back and you see Paul's conversion on the, uh, there you're going to see where it says uh, back in um, Acts chapter 9, and he says in verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, 
He's talking to Ananias. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So there you go. Point two. True doctrine demands true experience. Today, most believers have no concept of the spiritual life and are under punishment trying to compensate for that punishment by gaining the attention of God by their works. And <clears throat> breaks my heart that pastors won't teach the spiritual life and of the beginning of the concept of the priesthood. Do you know why the the uh, the priests of Israel wore a, a breastplate? They had a breastplate that they would put on before they served, and it had different jewels, and it had pearl, onyx, diamond, sapphire. Ruby, emerald, had all the stones there on the breastplate. I'll tell you why. In Ezekiel 28, Lucifer, it says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. Why did the priest of Israel wear the breastplate? So that God the Father could point down to the priest of Israel and say, Now look, I've given him a priesthood. And he can't even see me. And yet he's willing to function in it. Why couldn't you? You see, Lucifer had a priesthood also. And every precious stone was his covering. But what happened? In arrogance, he rejected God's plan for his life. And went for his own. And Christianity in arrogance, rejects the priesthood and operating clean in it. And they produce their own religious system of works. And they say, rebound is so stupid. I, it sounds like a... I don't understand it. Why do you emphasize it? Because God the Father can point down to you in the church age and say... Now look over here, Satan. There's my people down there. They have their unique priesthood in the church age. And they can't even see me. Yet they have my doctrine. They have my plan for their life. And they're willing to function in their priesthood. Now why couldn't you? And see, the entrance into the spiritual life is understanding operating clean from the priesthood. How many pastors are teaching the importance of operating clean from the priesthood? And Jesus would even say, you can do no good apart from me. It's amazing. And so all of these believers out here are functioning 
under experience. And they are religious. They're suffering for it. Now Paul, see, he wanted to go back and take a Nazarite vow. That's part of the Old Testament. He didn't need to go back there. That was an experience. So point three, when you get into punishment and reject rebound, it's inevitable that you'll come up with false doctrine. And I went to revival when I was a kid. We had revival once a year. You, uh, you invite some pastor to come in the building and say what the regular pastor's not willing to say. But if you think about revival, revival is, is supposed to be revival of phase two truth. Bible doctrine. And... Uh, the fact that the gospel is shared uh, is is not revival. That is that is being born again. That's the start. So if you really want to re kickstart somebody's spiritual life, you start teaching the principles of post salvation Christian life, and so even the well, what are you doing this week? I'm going to revival. I'm going to hear them evangelize the socks off of people who saved all night. And, and that's what happened. You get into punishment. You reject rebound. It's inevitable that you come up with false doctrine. And the idea of revival... It's, the word revival means bringing back something, bringing something up. And it, was, it wasn't that they were bringing up phase two life again and reteaching the principles of the Christian way of life. It's that they were getting emotional about the gospel and urging someone to walk the aisle. And uh, that was a false doctrine. False doctrine. They should have said, we're going to have Super Evangelist Week. Drag every unbeliever you know here. We're going to preach them the gospel. They, should, they had it named the wrong thing. It wasn't revival. It was evangelism. The point four, emotion in itself is not bad. Not simple. Or immoral, but bad emotion. Let's call it bad emotion. Redirects our thinking and crowds it into the area of garbage in the soul. It leads to a sentimentality that takes a higher priority than anything else in our lives. Being sentimental or nostalgic is normal, but it has a great danger related to it. You can become under soul blindness or even leading all the way up to Pentecostalism, charismaticism, emotionalism, and even becoming a holy roller. See, emotion is supposed to be subservient to the mentality, and it is the appreciator of the soul. And you can be overcome with emotion in appreciation. And I find that many times myself, uh, now in my life, It's amazing, you know, I, you study in, in uh, high school, we even studied, uh, you know, what happened in Germany and how part of Germany fell under uh, Soviet communism and how life there was bleak and people were willing to risk their lives to escape in uh, and go to free Germany and, and 
live and and if you you looked into uh over on the communist side you saw a lot of bleakness and blandness and people struggling for survival and they didn't have the optimism about life they didn't have any kind of a uh, in America we have the idea that we can make something we can do something we've got our freedom and we've got opportunity to go out and and prosper under our own hard work well, when you get under communism, that doesn't exist. See, there's no opportunity. There's no free market. And it, it translates over into life. And you, not only do you lose your beautiful homes that people have poured their souls into, you, and you get government housing and concrete walls and bleakness and blandness there, but you lose things like uh, beautiful art, uh, beautiful flower gardens, uh, vehicles that maybe someone uh, customizes to suit their own taste. You lose all of those things. You you lose the uh, outpouring of the soul and effort. And and now in my day, guess what's happening in America? We are, we're suffering under a socialist revolution that is going to turn most of society into government slaves. And government, see, their, the optimism will leave America and her beauty with it. And so it's amazing how we studied these things and how... Uh, they're coming true now even here on our own soil. And I can become sentimental about the old days, but it's a very dangerous thing to do because it can also lead to anger. Point five, you can become emotional about something that pushes doctrine right out of the stream of consciousness. All became spiritually blind from bad emotion. So you want the mentality and doctrine to be in the leadership position and in, in authority of the soul. And you want emotion to be subservient to doctrine. When you let emotion be the dictator of the soul, you're going to head down the wrong road. So point six, the spiritual life is a system of thinking. Paul tried to compromise with the Jewish holy rollers. There's no compromise with them. No one has a good experience in the spiritual life until they're qualified. And the qualification is Bible doctrine in the soul. And you'll never see what I, I love the Bible conference in September. Because Joe's motto is boring Bible class is what it takes. And what you're going to find out is the people that are down there to listen to him absolutely love boring Bible classes. Because large stacks of boring Bible classes is the way to the top, friend. The way to the top. And when you look around, mostly, and you see these people who are there for boring Bible class and they're ecstatic about it, what you're getting is a good preview of the super grace section at the Bema Seat of Christ. 
Because all of these people have figured out how to sidestep religion and recognize that Bible doctrine is the first priority in the spiritual life. Now, one, see, now once you're there to that point, now you look around and you're at a Bible conference in Shreveport, Louisiana, and you're having an experience. And that, to me, is true revival, where you get to see people from all around the world with like-mindedness, like-mindedness, and so you have a phileo love for one another. You, you may not even know them that great. But you say, hey, are you a Dorito? And they laugh and say, yes, I'm a Dorito too. And they, you see, they know exactly what they're talking about. But nobody else does. See, it's compatibility. So it'll be a true it'll be a true experience, and there may be emotion involved. But guess what? Bible doctrine is at the forefront. So point seven. Paul wrote Colossians three twenty five after he had rebounded after he got in jail and he got to cool his heels and he figured out he had gone down the wrong road. He says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of that wrongdoing. That's the ironclad law of volitional responsibility. Or there is no partiality. So that includes divine discipline also. Paul came close to dying to sin unto death because there is no partiality in the righteousness of God. He realized he nearly died. He nearly got ripped to shred by a bunch of religious people. And it was the uh, police and the army who saved him. Then he also wrote, point eight, whose God is their emotional pattern in Philippians 3.19 after he rebounded. And see, he was guilty of that. He didn't follow the will of God for his life. The will of God for Paul's life was for him to go to Rome and lead the churches in Rome. But he went to Jerusalem because he followed his emotion and his sentimentality. By the way, if you let how you feel dictate your Christian life, you have turned yourself into a God. You are worshiping your own emotional pattern You say, well, the Old Testament says a lot about not worshiping idols. And I don't see how that has any application. Well, idol worship was demon worship, who are lowercase g gods. Following your how you feel in life is, guess what? Idol worship, lowercase g You've made your own emotional pattern into a God. Oh, you're not worship. See, what does the Bible say about worshiping God? Those who worship Him must worship Him in what? The sphere of the Spirit. That means clean from their priesthood. And in the sphere of truth. That means Bible doctrine. Well, we've got a whole world of Christianity who is idol worshipers. The Old Testament has lots of application. Point nine. You cannot evaluate experience without Bible doctrine. 
that is biblical theology. So if something happens to you in a maybe religious event, you have nothing to weigh it against or to filter it through if you have no truth in your soul and you fall, uh, you may fall victim to a false experience. And I've heard of the charismatics getting so carried away and that... Uh, They've had miracles happen in church. And so-called sightings of apparitions. Well, guess what? Everything that is real is not from God. So that the Antichrist and the false prophet will make fire fall from heaven and a statue to speak. It says... God sent them strong delusion because they did not develop a love for the truth. What does that take? Doctrine is the only insulation of the soul we have against false experiences like these things I'm speaking of. Therefore, it's very important. So, point 10, Bible doctrine has epinosis, full knowledge, circulating in the stream of consciousness through the mentorship of God the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, must precede proper fulfillment of the protocol plan of God, of the protocol in the plan of God. Uh, you got some real easy directions here. Operate clean from the priesthood and put doctrine first. And if you haven't had a crash course of Bible doctrine, friends, you better get on one quick. And I'm talking about a crash course where you're sitting in front of a tape recorder hammering out lessons back to back, filling up notebooks full of notes. You've got to accumulate enough doctrine in your soul to carry you, friend, because hard times are coming. You say, I don't know how it could get any harder. Gas is $5 a gallon. Wait till there's nothing on the shelves. You're down here fishing in the ditch for a crawdad to make some soup. See, Jeremiah got thrown in a muddy well. He suffered along with his own generation who was apostate. And he was a super grace believer. Did he die? No. Did he suffer? Yes. It was an even agony of soul. Inside he was gut-wrenched because of what had happened. You better pile up some doctrine now. While there's time, we may not always get to do this. So, point 11 is RTRW, the right thing in the right way. Point A, a wrong thing done in a wrong way is wrong. That's see, you can't argue that. Paul took a vow that violated everything he wrote in Romans and Galatians. The Nazarite vow which he took was from the Old Testament, which is set aside for the new dispensation. There is no Nazarite vow in the church age. Just like he told, uh, the whole book of Galatians is preaching against legalism and the, the religious Judaizers had come in behind Paul and told the 
people of Galatia that they they needed the men needed to be circumcised and that the they needed to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy and there were certain points of the Mosaic law that needed to be kept. What did he do? He disbanded the whole thing. And he taught grace. Well, that was contrary to him taking the Nazarite vow, was it not? So point B, a wrong thing done in a right way is also wrong. When Paul took the Nazarite vow, it was in the wrong dispensation. But it was right for a past dispensation. The only legitimate vow for the church age is the marriage vow for the believer who gets married. That vow is the only reason for having a ceremony. So he took the Nazarite vow and he did it the right way, but it was in the wrong dispensation. Point C, a right thing done in a wrong way is wrong. Paul personally wanted to take to Jerusalem the great offering that had been collected for poor believers. But he, used, he was using it to buy himself an audience with his old friends. Look at all of the money I've collected. So point D, only a right thing done in a right way is right. And you say, give me an example. Sitting in Bible class, clean from the priesthood. Right thing, right way. So point 12. Paul's first human warning not to go to Jerusalem is found in Acts 21.4. We read the passage. There's a spirit-filled congregation warning Paul. Point 13, Paul's second warning is in Acts 21.8, also 11. Uh, we didn't mention the fact that Philip the Evangelist was one of the seven, uh, original seven deacons responsible for the daily distribution of food to the earlier believers in Jerusalem. And in point 14, we learn that the dramatic warning using Paul's own belt recognizes that all of these believers knew the will of God for Paul's life and Paul did not recognize it himself. And this is really how we can become arrogant, very arrogant when we get emotional. We get ham-headed. And I think that uh, one of the sayings that we have is that we're totally flexible about the inconsequential or the things that may not have the ultimate importance you have to be totally flexible about the unimportant but totally inflexible about what is important and uh, that's doctrine and what i think is important is uh is bible class and consistency and uh 
that's the reason that uh, I've never missed a Bible class because of sickness. And it's not that I have never been sick or never felt bad. There's been plenty of times where I didn't uh, feel good or didn't feel uh, like being here or was maybe even sick. But uh, I'm inflexible about it. You know, if I'm not here, that something terrible has happened. And there's been a fiery flaming crash somewhere. And that uh, I, I'm, I get here several hours early so that if I break down, I can jog and still get here in time. And you know me, I'll do it. I've always been here. I'm like the sun coming up. And I'm inflexible about it. I want to be here. This is what is important. Everything else can fall to the wayside. Bible class is very important. And if I have visitors in my home and they're, and they're staying on Sunday, guess what? Y'all take care of yourselves. I'm going to church. Wednesday night, same way. My boss says, well, I need you to do this, this, and this, and this tonight. Sir, I'll be leaving at 4.30 sharp. I've got church tonight. Oh, I don't care if it makes you mad. I'll be here. I'm inflexible about it. But I'm totally flexible about the inconsequential or the unimportant. I can be very lenient about things that don't really matter in the long range of things. And see, Paul, he got dogmatic about going to Jerusalem and he was being sentimental and he should have been open-minded and he should have been flexible about what these people were saying and he should have been cognizant of the fact that he was in carnality from being emotion, emotional and that they were spiritual and given him a true warning. He couldn't hear it. Couldn't hear it. So point 15. Bad emotion weakens the believer. Doctrine strengthens the believer. People who get on an emotional high cannot be reached by anything that is true or correct. Emotion puts a wall around you that makes you stupid. Regardless of how much wisdom you have. When a person gets emotional, you cannot counsel them. It's not your job to straighten anybody out. And you may have good friends that you can chew on a little bit. And the reason that they'll take it is because they're your good friend. And they may laugh a little bit after you give them a hard time. And they recognize that uh, you're there and you're relaxed about it. But very few people have that close a friend. Most people you can only lackadaisically mention. Point 16, emotion destroys the perspective of the future. The believer in a state of carnality anticipates the wrong things. be accurate about our future or our present we must have doctrine circulating in the stream of consciousness the believer overcome by emotion loses the doctrinal perspective of the will of god and i'll tell you it's terrible in the philippines most of their daily uh christian sharings it sounds like god is a fortune cookie Good things are coming your way. Just pray. It's just like the evangelist that says, if you give tonight, there'll be a check in your mailbox from God tomorrow.
Well, I'm sorry. The historical trend at the end of the church age is apostasy. And you're not picking your Bible up and you're not studying it. See, we're not going backwards in history. We're going forwards. We're headed towards the rapture. And the generation, the rapture generation, are they're terrible. The people are terrible. And how do you see... You need to make it to super grace just so you can be Jeremiah and not be laying in the street as a corpse. Or like the Exodus generation that the buzzards picked at their carcasses in the desert. Oh, I don't see how it could get any worse. Yeah. Well, all you got to do is read the end of 2 Timothy and you'll find out. See, here's the historical trend of the rapture generation. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. There you go. There's your fortune cookie. Wasn't that bright? See, you, the only hope you've got is in Bible doctrine and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And while our country... See, love of country is a great thing. But you better not have that at the forefront of your mentality right now because you'll be mad. This is just simply the road that we have to go down because the saltiness is losing its savor. To be thrown under foot of men and trampled. So you've got to read the rest of it. Point 17. What did Paul emphasize after almost dying to sin unto death? Thinking, not emotion. Got a few verses from Philippians here. Philippians 2.5, he emphasized thinking. It says, let this objective thinking be in you, which was also in Christ. Christ Jesus. And speaking of genuine humility, you got three. Philippians 3.18 For many keep walking, that means the nature of their life. Concerning whom, I've told you many times, that means he's warned them. And I tell you now, even weeping, Wept because of not only their failure, but because of his own. These are enemies of the cross. Even Paul was talking about himself for his failure. Whose end is destruction. That means the sin unto death. Whose God is their emotional pattern. Whose glory is their shame. To keep thinking about earthly things. For our polytomai is in heaven. Emotional activity becomes a system of shame. Now, I've shared this verse with you, Philippians 4, 8. He says, think on these things. Now, I'm going to read it here. 
and then I've got an expanded translation I want to share with you tonight. And uh, it's, it's very good. It's uh, something you need to take to your steering wheel on the way to work. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think or concentrate upon these things. So he is, he's pointing to the fact that we need to be circulating something up here. Let's give you the expanded translation. What are all these things we're supposed to be concentrating upon, Paul? Everything that is true, that is aletheus, doctrine. Everything that is honorable, noble, or worthy of respect that refers to God's laws of establishment. Everything that is righteous or dikaios, that's translated just, fair, or equitable, including capacity for seeking objective justice for all. Everything that is pure, that means from all evil. Anything restricting freedom of the individual under the laws of divine establishment. Therefore, Satan's law are evil. Everything that is love capacities. Lovely is what is translated. Plural, love for God or right man, right woman, or even phileo, love for friends. Everything that is commendable. That's capacity for life. It depreciate good things like music, art, drama, literature. In my case, could even be fabrication or engineering or all the different kinds of variables and mechanics. If there is any moral goodness, virtue, that includes courage. And if anything worthy of praise, and there is, then you yourselves concentrate on these things. Well, Paul totally switched gears from being emotional and sentimental to thinking and uh, we certainly have some good warnings and examples from the Bible including the life of Paul well we'll pick him up next week I don't have time for tonight and <clears throat> Continue looking at the life of Paul. I'm certainly thankful for Bible doctrine. It kept me out of a lot of, of religious activities and a lot of sentimental activity. I, I could be stuck in religion right now were it not for doctrine. And it was doctrine that saved me from being under, under all kinds of discipline right now in my life. I even know a path. I know... I know several pastors personally who had doctrine and they got sentimental. And they are suffering right now. And I look at you all and I look at the blessing that is involved in our relationship in our church. And it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning to be where I am today. And I'm so thankful for it. For doctrine and for you all. Okay, I thank you for your attention and attendance.